Hello folks, I'm Pamela Young. This is Thrive 2030, uh, brought to you by Growth Curve. And today I've got Dennis Brunetti with me, who is the president of Ericsson in Vietnam, Myanmar, Cambodia and Laos. How are you today, Dennis? Thanks for joining us. Oh, very well. Very good, Pamela. Thank you for having me on. Oh, my great, great pleasure. Thanks for giving us time. I know you're all busy up there. Um, I just wanted to very briefly outline a little bit about your background and the company Ericsson. So you started with them as a new graduate in Melbourne, Australia, many years ago. And uh, then you moved firstly to Sweden, um, then to Hong Kong. Um, where else have you been? Sri Lanka and Vietnam. Is that the journey? Yes, that's right. That's yes. right, yeah. So you've had 30 years with the company and 20 of those years have been in Asia or Sweden. Um, so really looking forward to tapping into that experience today. Now I also understand, Dennis, that you are on a number of roles, the Vietnam Business Council for Sustainable Development, the Vietnam Business Council for Women's Empowerment, um, Auschan, which is the Australian Chamber in Vietnam. Um, I think you're also formerly the chairman of the European Business Council. Is that correct? Yeah, the European Chamber of Commerce in Vietnam, correct. European correct, yeah. Chamber of Commerce. Chairman. Yeah, um, that's a very um, uh, significant role that you had there. And also the RMIT, you're on one of their advisory board councils. That's right. I'm on the Industry Advisory Council for the new school that's formed under RMIT in Vietnam called Science, Technology and Engineering. All right. So um, you've really um, got your finger in lots of pies. So I'm really interested to tap into some of those experiences a bit later in the, this conversation. Let's just talk about Ericsson for a moment, which is one of the... Uh, biggest global um, ICT uh, businesses in the world, uh, which is in mobile technology and 5G, uh, which is a really important part of bringing um, nations up to speed with their technology to allow businesses to grow and connect with one another. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, you have been around for almost 150 years, Ericsson. It goes back to the 18. Uh, 1870s, I think. 1876. Yeah. And you've got over 100,000 people worldwide. So quite a big band of uh, men and women to um, embrace and keep focused through this period of the pandemic. So looking forward to hearing how you've been doing that. Um, what are the other highlights of Ericsson that you'd like to point out to us? Yeah, sure. I we're born out of Sweden, of course. We're headquartered in Sweden still today in Stockholm, but we are a multinational, transnational company for many, many years, like you say, in over 185 countries, really building out those mobile broadband connection, um, mobile broadband networks, rather, across the world, starting with 1st G, 2G, 3G, 4G, and now, of course, 5G. Um, our mission in life really is to create connections that make the unimaginable possible, uh, and through limitless, limitless connectivity, mobile broadband connectivity, we help improve the lives of people uh, and business and uh, society in general in terms of the environment, creating a sustainable environment. So it's that triple bottom line benefit of society, business and environment that we impact in a favourable way through limitless broadband connectivity. Fantastic. Just before we move on to talking about your um, move to um, Hanoi in Vietnam, I'm going to join you there in beautiful Hanoi. Now, this is one of the lakes uh, whose name I forget. Um, yeah. One Kim Lake. One Kim Lake in downtown Kim Hanoi. Lake. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to join you here in beautiful Hanoi. Um, it's a very pretty environment. Have you been on this lake? I was walking around it last night, actually. I walk really? around it most nights. Yeah, it's great exercise. A beautiful view. It's a very, very pretty vista. So um, I'm pleased to join you there. Now, um, uh, Dennis, can we just talk, how did you get to Vietnam? How long have you been there? And um, uh, what has your experience of the past 18 months been? Sure. I, I, so I got to Vietnam the first time, actually, in 1996, because Ericsson at that time also was helping Telstra. Back in those days, they were called Telecom. Yeah. Uh, in Vietnam, build out some international gateway switching. So Ericsson was supplying equipment to Telstra as part of that operation, which they had as a business corporation contract, the BCC arrangement, with a local operator in, in Vietnam. So Telstra um, was working across a number of countries um, back then. Yeah. So as a customer of Ericsson, I was travelling to Vietnam since back in 96, in and out of the country, based out of Melbourne and Hong Kong and later Sweden. But I moved to Vietnam in 2008 for a few years as a vice president, then moved to Sri Lanka as country head there, along with Maldives, and then back to Vietnam since 2017, July 2017, as the president of Ericsson Vietnam, Myanmar, Cambodia and Laos. So, oh, yeah. And over the last 18 months, of course, during the COVID pandemic, 
uh, globally, Ericsson has had and encouraged all its employees to put health and safety and family first, mm. business second. So family, health and safety first, work from home, work from anywhere where it's safe. Yeah. And we've had that policy across the company. And in Vietnam, we've, of course, adhered to it very strictly. We've had a lot more freedom and luxury here in the sense that uh, the government managed and handled the COVID situation so well uh, and throughout the whole period. We were able to still have 50% of our people working out of the office for most of that time. And I'm actually in the office now and we're working from here currently. Um, but basically, we allow people to work from anywhere. And our mobile broadband technology, 4G in particular, in Vietnam and around the world, um, many people were able to use that to be able to work online, of course, um, and also study online, etc. So I think our technology, our mobile broadband technology, as well as fixed broadband technology, has helped um, enable people to continue to work even during the pandemic from anywhere where it's safe. And even you and I are now having this online discussion, we're using broadband technology to, to facilitate that. So we're very proud of our contribution to that. Yes. Um, if you were to sort of sum up uh, the situation in Vietnam and Hanoi um, in the last couple of months, I know that you had a pretty good journey for the first 12 months. Um, there's been a bit of lockdown in the last few months, um, but now you've passed the worst again. What's the general feeling yes. today about, you know, where you're sitting and what are the attitudes of um, business people in Hanoi this week? Yeah, it's a good question. I think it's still very optimistic and very confident. Uh, the government has really dealt with this whole pandemic in a, in a sort of very strategic way, very one country, one people, one strategy, one approach kind of way. No boundaries between areas. I mean, it's been a one country approach. And I think that's been key to their success. Uh, the fourth wave you talked about um, was pretty hard. You know, the Delta variant, I think, hit everyone pretty hard across the world, of course. So we came out of significant lockdowns now in Ho Chi Minh City and Hanoi. Yeah. especially in Ho Chi Minh City, about four to five months. But now people are out, able to go to the office and, of course, work in different environments um, more flexibly. Restaurants have started to open up mm -hmm. step by step. And we're now adopting a policy in Vietnam, like many other countries, where we're creating zones across the city and across the country, green zone, yellow zone, red zone, etc. And we're basically adopting the strategy and the government has adopted a strategy of learning to live with COVID rather than aiming for zero COVID cases, but really allowing for people and for companies and for uh, society to function, yeah. but in a responsible way, in a safe way that minimises the negative impact and maximises the positive impact on the economy, of course, and people's well-being, of course. So yeah. um, I think the government's done the right thing and they've got the right balance and people are quite comfortable and confident, both locals but also international businessmen like me, business people, uh, are very, I think, um, positive and embracing of the strategy adopted by the government and investment is flowing back into Vietnam. Uh, it continues to grow. Last year was still 3% GDP growth, plus 3%. Most countries were negative last year and Vietnam, even this year, 2021, will be positive. Um, Dennis, uh, most of us had to pivot rather quickly when COVID came around early 2020. Um, for a lot of companies, that was a major challenge because they weren't digitally prepared. But I expect technology companies might have had a different experience because you're probably a little bit more advanced than us. But I'd like you to tell us, you know, whether you were and how you managed to do that. But also, the second part of this question is, um, other than technology, what other major adjustments did you have to make as a global business in 185 countries when COVID came along and you realised you had to step up and make a change? Sure. Yeah, certainly we trust in technology, obviously, as, uh, as Ericsson, we're a leader in 5G globally. We leverage the mobile broadband and fixed broadband technologies that are available to us, of course, and enable people, yeah. uh, our organisation across the world, to work from home or from anywhere we're safe, actually. And that's been our policy, actually, since the beginning of the pandemic globally, We've encouraged all our people across all offices around the world, irrespective of the status of the COVID situation in those respective markets, to work from home. Because we trust in our people, we trust in their empowerment uh, and their confidence and capabilities, and they can work pretty much from anywhere um, where outcomes result orientated in terms of the way we work. Yeah. Uh, it's not about clocking in or clocking out. We've never been that sort of company even before COVID. So we were always giving people flexible time and flexible hours and flexible sort of workspace um, uh, environments to work within. So from that perspective, I think the transition was quite smooth. Um, and from a people, personal uh, perspective, of course, Ericsson has five key 
pillars when it comes to Ericsson on the Move. We, we call it Ericsson on the Move as a program that we launched last year. Okay. Uh, and it actually encompasses compassion uh, and empathy. And it encompasses also collaboration and cooperation across the organisation and speak up culture and, um, and speedy execution as well as fact-based decision making. So all those areas we really focus in on. And of course, with COVID, they all became quite sharpened, and I think, you know, really accentuated in many ways or amplified in their importance, especially mm-hmm. when it comes to empathy. Yeah. So really, everyone has their own personal and professional requirements in life. Yeah. And we gave people the flexibility and the freedom to choose what's best for them. And then, of course, we did a lot of online coffees and coffee chats and mm-hmm. social things. We've got Christmas parties and end-of-year parties and other religious parties as well, I mean, events yeah. that we do online. So yes, uh, we're Amazon. doing one of those in Amazon. December as well, you know, yeah. where people do a lot of performances and shows and we have a talent contest, you know, and uh, we have judges deciding who, who wins and comes second and third and fourth. And we did that last year. We're doing it again this December as well. So wonder, that type of entertainment wonder, is important too. I wonder if um, people are less inhibited doing performances uh, online as opposed to being on a stage and um, being in front of friends. We've all had to develop a whole bunch of new skills, haven't we? And, yeah, you know, and, sure. And, and most parents have had to learn to be homeschooling parents, and that's a challenge because yeah. a lot of them have to teach subjects that they don't know. So... I think it's been quite a big learning curve in lots of ways. Um, one of the things about Thrive 2030 is to try and identify uh, and, and get um, advice from people like yourself to help others um, uh, look at the opportunities that are ahead of them to help them make uh, get back to work, to help them grow their businesses, to help them strengthen their businesses so they can thrive to 2030. Sure. Now, you're in the 5G business, and I understand that that's going to provide lots of opportunity for people. And I hear from people that they're, t- they're over COVID, they're tired of the whole, you know, yeah. adjusting story, and what they'd like is advice about how to grow their businesses. And I think maybe your story about what 5G can do for businesses and economies might um, be helpful. So would you tell us what 5G can do for countries that haven't got, got it yet or, or people who haven't got yeah, it? Yeah, sure. Sure. I, I think to talk about 5G, we probably need to put it in context because most people are thinking, well, what was 4G about then or 3G and how <laughs> is 5G different to those, you know? Yeah. So every generation of mobile telephony uh, adds speed, adds bandwidth, adds the number of devices that can be connected from a density perspective, square meter density perspective, um, and also reduces the latency uh, in terms of delays, uh, and that's important for gaming and all that sort of business, Um, remote surgery and remote robotics on factory floors. You know, delay is super important. So latency, for example, with 4G, you have about 100 milliseconds, and then with 5G, you go down to one millisecond. Power consumption, energy consumption, much lower, 10 times lower with 5G than 4G. And again, that plays well to our focus on the environment and reducing carbon dioxide emissions. Yeah. Um, also, when it comes to bandwidth, it's a fatter pipe. It's got more data that can actually flow through it, greater bandwidth, as well as higher speeds, 10 times higher speed than, than 4G. So those higher speeds, greater bandwidth, lower latency, lower power consumption, better spectral efficiency as well, so you get more data per spectrum, per megahertz of spectrum, means that you basically can lower the cost of delivering the same more broadband experience to the consumer and to the enterprise. Okay. Um, you can also then engage in new applications and use cases that are more enterprise industry centric because of the super low latency and high bandwidth and high speed. All of a sudden, it's not just consumers or people that benefit from being connected to the internet and having all these cool applications, especially in social media, video streaming, AR, VR, for gaming, all those things that we're used to for consumers. Now it also expands out to enterprise and industry. So smart manufacturing Mm -hmm. is enabled through 5G. Mm -hmm. Industry 4.0, which is the convergence of the physical and cyber world, that is the fourth industrial revolution, effectively. Mm -hmm. Um, And that basically will enable factories to be equipped with robots that are wireless, remote controlled, inventory that can be managed remotely, of course, um, all sorts of maintenance can be done preventatively and proactively remotely. Uh, less human touch, less human interaction, less physical touch. That increases efficiency and productivity. So labour productivity growth rates can then increase in production, making countries like Vietnam, along with other adjacent ASEAN countries, more competitive in attracting manufacturing um, investments. And certainly manufacturing still accounts for a significant proportion of GDP in this part of the world. And we know that by 2025, 
about two-thirds of MNCs globally will have their manufacturing hubs based in Asia-Pacific. So that's very attractive to Vietnam and to Myanmar and to Malaysia and Philippines and Thailand, etc., in attracting that manufacturing investment. But in order to do that, companies will want to know that there is digital infrastructure in place in those countries. Mm -hmm. So 5G is the critical national digital infrastructure moving forward, just as in the past, roads, bridges, tunnels, mm -hmm. airports, seaports, that physical infrastructure helped spur and drive economic growth. The next wave of social economic development will be driven and created very much by digital transformation, enabled by digital technology like 5G as critical national infrastructure. So having that platform in place helps drive the whole smart city in initiatives as well that are going on around the world. Okay. So manufacturing is one example, logistics, healthcare, remote surgery, telehealth became super important during COVID. 5G will enable a person, a doctor to do surgery on a patient without the patient actually being physically there. They'll, they'll both use, move the scalpel and move different equipment that will be done basically by a robot in a different location to the actual patient. And that's because of the very low latency and high bandwidth and high speed enables the doctor to do that at the same time in real time with a robot. So that also that is important, scary. telehealth. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the list goes on, but all enterprises, industries across all sectors will benefit from digital transformation in terms of productivity, efficiency gains. But at the same time, 5G is an innovation platform, so it will also help create new use cases, new applications, new industries, new jobs. So as much as the okay. traditional industries like manufacturing and agriculture, especially in this part of the world, that account for over 30% GDP in Vietnam, as an example, retail, fishery, forestry, these jobs will be increasingly displaced over time due to automation. They need to be in order to become more productive and efficient. At the same time, those jobs that will be displaced will be more than compensated for by the jobs that will be created with science, technology, innovation. And that's the next real wave of social economic development in this part of the world. And we're driven by science, technology, innovation, enabled by 5G startup entrepreneurship. And data will become the new oil. Data will become the new oil that fuels and fuels and feeds the internet and the digital economy, which is the engine of growth. And that will drive and create the next wave of social economic development. Okay, so um, on that point, though, uh, if you're just looking across Asia Pacific, how far, yeah. um, there's 48 countries in Asia, how far sure. across the 48 countries is 5G? Uh, how far around yeah, so, is it? Yeah, so so far, globally, I can tell you that there's quite a large number of countries already in Asia and in, in Europe and in North America in particular. So North America was really early in 5G, around 2018-19 with Verizon, at t and others. Telstra in Australia launched 5G also a couple of years ago already. So they were very early off the blocks. In Asia, our part of the world, it was Japan and Korea that went early with 5G. And Ericsson was very active there. We've now got over 100 5G live networks globally, actually. We've done trials in Vietnam and we're waiting for the actual 5G uh, licenses to be permanently given to the operators. But at the moment, they've got temporary licenses and we've done trials even for the operators over the last 18 months. Okay. Um, and we see 5G already starting off in uh, in Malaysia, mm. in Thailand, uh, and we see it moving forward in Vietnam in 2022 in a sort of commercial mass deployment sense, late 22, early 20, in the Philippines. Yeah. Singapore's already moving forward with 5G. So 5G is taking off in different countries at different times. Um, but 4G, we shouldn't underestimate the value of 4G. 4G still has a lot of value and, and certainly... 4G from a consumer perspective and to a certain extent with industry has a significant role to play over the coming years. So we're telling our customers, we're informing them or recommending that as well as planning for 5G, um, it's important to also continue to expand, invest in capacity increases and coverage increases for 4G. Yeah. 4G still has a lot of um, room for growth, absolutely, and a lot of value for consumers and enterprise. Yes. Um, one of the sectors uh, that I'd like to just get your advice on is the maritime industry, the shipping industry, the containers, the transport. Um, we know that we've got a massive blockage in the supply chain globally. Um, and I've learned through these conversations that uh, large parts of that supply chain are not well enough automated, which is why there's been a bit of a bottleneck. So it's not just because ports have closed down because they've got COVID cases. But, but 
you know, the people are still um, waiting for others to get up to speed and the communication and automation has not been as well enough advanced to allow it to flow straight, seamlessly. So I'm wondering what your advice would be to people in those sectors, um, shipping, transport, um, logistics. Sure. What can they yeah. be doing in the next, just the next 12 months? What should they look at to try and advance what they're doing so that, you know, we don't have another problem if there's another rise of a new strain or another pandemic two or three yards down the track? What should they do in the next 12 months that would help them unblock sure. the supply chain? I think embracing digital transformation is important. Taking an end-to-end, -end, total end-to-end -end, uh, digital transformation program strategy and then of course implementing it execute it in a phased approach start small and expand but certainly embracing an end-to-end -end strategic digital transformation engagement is important working with operators mobile operators yeah. as well as other partners in creating um, a strategy for digitally transforming their businesses because they do need to become more automa automated yeah. and more wireless more mobile mm -hmm. so connecting the ships the container ships, con connecting the containers themselves, con connecting the goods within the containers to the internet from a mobile broadband perspective, connecting them remotely so that they can be managed and tracked at every point, having um, SIMs or um, IoT devices embedded in the goods and in the containers so that they can be monitored and uh, controlled from a wireless perspective is important. Ships then, you know, people can manage and know when they're at different points in their journey arriving at the port just in time to offload rather than having to hover there or stagnate for, for days potentially and consume all that carbon dioxide and, or rather all that energy and, and really emit a lot of carbon dioxide inefficiently. Yeah. That needs to be avoided. And the best way to do that is to really streamline transit routes and streamline transportation. And the best way to do that is to automate it through mobile uh, broadband technology like 5G. And when I mentioned earlier, if you recall on 5G, I highlighted the fact that with 5G versus 4G versus 3G, you have a higher density of devices, a higher number of devices per square metre that can be connected to the mobile network. That becomes super important because you've only got nine, you've got 9 billion people in the world. Mm. But when you start talking about devices like containers or goods or any items that need to be connected to the mobile broadband network, um, then you need IoT, Internet of Things, devices connected and that then becomes much more than 9 billion of course then you're looking at 30 billion 40 billion 50 billion we foresee by 2030 about 30 billion mm. uh, items will be connected to the mobile broadband networks or fixed and mobile broadband networks and about 5 billion of those will be mobile and and that means ultimately that we need to be able to provide that technology that has that capacity to, to sustain all those devices and all that data interaction and then use that data in real time to feed into manufacturing, to feed into logistics, to feed into healthcare, to feed into all these different industries, mm. and then to process that data and utilise it in real time. And that's really where mobile telephony and mobile broadband communication is so super important. So I would recommend that mm. those logistics companies work closely with their technology partners to create an end-to-end -end digital transformation strategy yeah. uh, to automate and become more efficient and productive. And that will help not only their business, it will help consumers. We'll get goods on time when we want it and when we need it. But at the same time, it will help the environment. It will reduce carbon dioxide emissions through efficient transportation. Yes. Now, on that point of the environment, you are um, on the business council of the Sus Vietnam Business Council for Sustainable Development. What are some of the priorities that you are trying to address um, through that business council and um, uh, with, you know, the current focus on um, speeding up uh, everybody's activity to try and become more sustainable and more green, which is just another thing we need to do while we're also doing our digital transformation, while we're also doing our response to the pandemic. So we're being spread sure. quite thin. Everybody's got a lot to do in the next three to five years sure. to make sure they survive to 2030. So yes. if you could give us some advice about what you're discussing in that council and um, what are the priorities that companies can do to make quick progress at least effort because I think people are stretched trying to do everything. Sure. Well, in Vietnam, of course, there's a lot of SMEs like in most countries uh, and Vietnam has a significant uh, proportion of its GDP attributed to the SME community. I would say it's about, I think, 60% of GDP is attributed to SMEs and about 90% of the workforce yes. come from SMEs. 
Yeah. And with all the free trade agreements that have been signed now and ratified and implemented between Vietnam and neighbouring countries and regions of the world, about 15 of them, I think, which is one of the highest numbers actually in this part of the world. They have recently signed, ratified and implemented with the EU. The EVFTA was done. I was also involved in that as co-chairman of the European Chamber of Commerce previously. Okay. Uh, the UK, Vietnam Free Trade Agreement, RCEP, CPTPP, all these uh, free trade agreements have enabled Vietnamese companies now to increase their trade potential with other countries, other regions of the world. Mm -hmm. And that then requires them to become more uh, quality conscious, of course, more sustainable, more focused on really producing high quality products consistently. And again, embracing, like I mentioned earlier in terms of logistics, embracing digital transformation in order to become more productive and efficient so they can lower their costs, meet, be more competitive on the world stage, mm -hmm. at the same time more environmental. Because really, you are killing three birds with one stone when you embrace digital transformation. Not only are you becoming more productive and efficient, you're also becoming more environmentally sustainable and more inclusive. Because again, I mean, when we talk about COVID, we talk about people working from anywhere, you know, from home or from anywhere they, they wish. That also then expands the whole concept of the workplace beyond the office environment. It enables... Uh, companies really to flourish and, and new companies to emerge as a result of the technology and the innovation that it enables in terms of business models. So that, of course, is super important for SMEs in Vietnam. And being, again, inclusive and sustainable and diverse, we're, we're really promoting in the Vietnam Business Council for Sustainable Development more women in, in SMEs in terms of managing and leading. And in Vietnam already today, one in four SMEs are run by women. Um, but the government has a target of about one in three within the coming years. I mean, this week, uh, the leaders have just uh, um, been at um, Glasgow COP conference, um, the, the summit. Uh, what is the view of people around you uh, to what you have heard from the leaders in the last couple of days? Sure. No, I think the people's sentiment is quite positive, especially in Vietnam, because our Prime Minister in Vietnam also was on the world stage giving a, a very good talk recently over the last couple of days. He's given a couple of very, very good talks. And, and Vietnam certainly is focused on clean energy and uh, driving the economy and um, making sure that social economic development continues to grow. I mean, Vietnam last year was plus 3% when most other countries were negative during 2020, 2020 and 2021 as well. Yes. That we're going to be positive in Vietnam. So the, the, GDP, the positive GDP and more importantly, the inclusive and sustainable nature of that GDP, it's much more diverse now uh, than it used to be. Um, it's not just centred around agriculture manufacturing. Now it's very much about tourism, services, education, healthcare, transport, many different industries that are actually contributing. The digital economy in Vietnam yeah. has tripled in the last five years and it continues to grow dramatically. Mm -hmm. But the government understands that with that growth, yeah. to break or decouple uh, the socioeconomic growth from the negative impacts on the environment, you need ICT. Because ICT has the potential to decouple socioeconomic growth from negative impacts on the environment mm -hmm. through what we discussed earlier. Carbon dioxide emissions are reduced when less people commute, for example, from home to office, when people can work from anywhere, yes. when you've got uh, smart energy, when you've got smart grids, smart energy grids, uh, smart transport, uh, telehealth, uh, e-education, all these things help reduce. And, of course, smart logistics we talked about earlier as well. Yes. Uh, reduces the negative impacts on the environment. And then, of course, our government in Vietnam is super focused on making sure that we embrace new innovative technologies mm. enabled by 5G. By 2030, they have a plan to actually have 30% of the GDP of Vietnam attributed to the digital economy mm. and about 7.5% annual uh, labour productivity growth rates by then as well. And by 2025, about 20% of the, the digital economy will or the GDP will be attributed to by the digital economy. So these clear targets have enabled the government to really set out a course that embraces technology and innovation, enabled by 5G as critical national infrastructure, to not only help enterprise and industries become more efficient and more productive, but also cleaner in terms of energy, in terms of carbon dioxide emissions. So Vietnam is committed very much to reducing carbon dioxide emissions. And I think Vietnam, you'll see over the coming years, will take a lead really embracing new innovative technologies in energy sector yeah. as well, enabled by technologies like 5G yeah. uh, with AI and IoT and machine learning 
and edge computing, VR, virtual reality, augmented reality, yeah. uh, all contributing to that. Fantastic. It's so exciting. Uh, these technologies um, offer so yeah. much opportunity, don't they? There's so much that we can do with it. And um, it, it boggles the mind, actually, when you start to think about it. Um, the last question is about younger users um, and the next generation who have grown up, you know, with technology. Um, a week or so ago, I was listening, uh, participating in a, in a sort of online event, which was in Australia, and it was the fintech community. Um, they had a number of um, uh, fintech uh, startup chief executives talking. One of them said uh, one of the challenges for them was getting talent. Because of the closed borders, they couldn't get the talent into the country um, to help them to grow their fintech startup. And it occurred to me that um, I, I thought at the time, but hang on a second, the world is working virtually right now. We are all tapping into one another via a computer. We don't even see one another. So it doesn't matter whether we're in Melbourne, Sydney, Adelaide, or Ho Chi Minh City, or you know, somewhere in India or somewhere in Africa. It doesn't really matter. So how are we going to shift that mindset that we have to have people once upon a time we thought we had to have them in the office now we've got used to this idea of letting them work from home how are we going to shift the mindset they've got to be in the country they have to be our same yeah, sure. they've got to be do you think the next mm. generation uh, will be much more comfortable working virtually from anywhere any country in the world absolutely yeah absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah. i'm of the older generation i guess so i was born in the late 60s and, um, and I've been in the telecom industry for over 30 years, yeah. but I've, I've embraced working from anywhere now for many years, actually, even well yeah. before COVID, yeah. because the, the technology is there. It enables you to do that. And, and then, of course, when you work in an environment, in a culture, and Ericsson really does promote uh, respect, professionalism, perseverance and integrity. They're the four key yeah. aspects of our values across the organisation. Um, and really live and breathe that in every sense and then have that enabled also by technology supporting us in the way we work, yeah. then really we have the perfect formula. It's a perfect storm. It's a, it's a really good way uh, for us to be able to, to work from anywhere. Trust is key. Yes. Empowerment is key. And in our culture, in our company culture, we empower our people. We trust our people. Yes. It's outcome results orientated um, organisation. So not I mean, time spent here or there. So ultimately, I think more and more companies are going that way. Mm -hmm. And then embracing diversity and inclusion is key. key because sure. you, you mentioned about the pool of talent. Yeah. You can expand that pool of talent significantly yes. when you, you know, really welcome all people from all genders, all religions and nationalities to be part of your organisation. Yeah. Uh, and that's what we do at Ericsson. That's why we have a strong d &I focus, diversity and inclusion focus, yeah. and also the Vietnam Business Coalition for uh, Women's Empowerment, the Vietnam Business Council for for um, for sustainable development. We're super focused on DNI because that's really important. Technology is great as an enabler, but it comes down to people. Technology also enables people to work remotely, not only work but rather train and develop their skills yes. remotely. Yes. So we have a lot of online courses, and Ericsson has this program called Ericsson Educate, where we train our people plus our customers yes. and partners on five G, IoT, automation, you know, AI, and all those things. Yes. So ultimately. I think it's important for people to embrace not only uh, the opportunity to work from anywhere, but study anywhere and develop their skills. So digital skills need to be increased as well. Science, technology, engineering, mathematics, not only at high school, tertiary level, but also, of course, uh, vocational training is important to retrain, reskill, upskill the existing workforce that will be displaced from their current jobs in the future due to automation. We know that that will happen in exactly. Vietnam. Probably about 70% of jobs will be displaced in the next three decades in fisheries and forestry, retail, agriculture and manufacturing, and about 56% across ASEAN. So to upskill those people towards the digital world and the digital age is yeah. very, very important. So it's about people. And I think that young people and old people, it doesn't matter who you are, actually, um, we will embrace more so... Uh, technology, and we will want to work for companies like Ericsson yep. that embraces not only technology but good core values and yep. diversity and inclusion really at the centrepiece of that um, yep. because people want to work for cool companies and cool organisations that are about diversity and inclusion and does provide them with technology and trust and empowerment to be able to work from anywhere, study anywhere, develop their skills anywhere and collaborate and cooperate, of course, in a good, meaningful way towards a vision, towards a purpose which yeah. makes sense, you know, for yeah. everyone. And Ericsson really does focus on that. We have a clear purpose and vision centred around social, business and enterprise and environmental benefits through connectivity. 
mobile broadband connectivity. That's one of the benefits of being 150 years old, I think, which is that yeah. um, you've got a very long you know, journey. You've had a long journey. You can look back and see um, the things that have been successful. Um, yes. you know, you've got more experience in understanding that being patient with people and getting to know people is really key. Um, which is, you know, culture, as they say, culture eats, eats strategy for breakfast. So getting Absolutely. your people, understanding, yes. and I think that, you know, the, the, the lady's comment in Australia about not being able to get talent because they weren't in the country is probably more about anxiety over diff working with different cultures remotely as opposed to anything else. Um, but the one thing COVID has done is it's forced everybody to the computer and the phone for connectivity. Even grandmas who were too frightened to use their phone to make payments or purchases now have to do their shopping online. Um, and so we're all being forced to do it. So... Um, although it, it has caused some differences in strata in the um, societies because a lot of people don't have access to a computer or a phone. But, um, sure. yeah, look, this has been so enlightening. We could talk on for hours. Um, your contribution today has been really, really helpful. I'm sure there are a lot of people who are um, itching to get their hands on 5G. Um, so <laughs> good luck with your continued rollout sure. across the region. Before I let you go, Dennis, I would like to ask you that last critical question, which is that if you were CEO of the world at some point in the future, what would be top of mind for you to address in the first 100 days? What uh, would you want to do that you think would help the world come together better, um, move forward together um, and address some of the big issues that we are facing? Sure. I'd want to do something, obviously, that addresses as many of the challenges of the world as possible. And clearly with climate change, with poverty, of course, and with COVID-19 and other challenges, I think digital transformation of the world is, is needed, really. I think if you, if you have countries embracing 5G technology as an example um, and creating that digital national infrastructure and then upskilling and reskilling the existing workforce towards a digital future and making sure that science, technology, engineering and mathematics uh, is uplifted at primary, high school levels and tertiary level, and for all genders, uh, making sure that we have diversity in our ICT industry in particular, mm -hmm. I would want to basically map out globally where the digital transformation or digital uh, infrastructure is in place in terms of 5G, for example, mm -hmm. which countries, which areas need to be uplifted to the latest technology when it comes to digital platforms. And then, of course, also map the, the digital skills of the people in those locations so across the world, map where there is digital skills uh, that are already at a good level or where there aren't uh, enough uh, digital skill in those environments or communities and uplift those. So it's about technology, digital technology and digital skills, making sure that we know where the gaps are and then uplift those to a level that enables people to really uplift their social um, economic standing, making sure that they have the opportunity to create their own jobs, create their own future. Yeah. And, and I think uh, digital technology and digital skills are the two key factors in that. And then I'd also make sure that academia works closely with government and with industry to create that environment. Mm. Because I think that you need a partnership between academia, government and industry in order to actually uplift the digital infrastructure and uplift the digital knowledge and skills of society at large. And that will make, I think, the world a better place and a safer place and a more environmentally uh, safe place. I get sure. that. It all makes really good sense. But I'm just wondering about the group of 50 of the least developed countries who have been at uh, the COP conference in Glasgow looking for financial support to help them with their climate change initiatives um, and for them to be able to meet those global targets. Um, as the Chief Executive of the World, I think your strategy sounds really sound, but I'm just wondering how you would go about helping those least developed countries to leapfrog, otherwise they will always be behind. Yeah, I, I think it's like Winston Churchill once said, I think it was Winston Churchill, the deeper we look into the past, the further we can see into the future. And if we look into the past, how did countries like Vietnam um, become so sustainable and so strong in terms of social economic development, averaging over 6% GDP for the last 20 years, poverty rate of less than 1%, 2% today in Vietnam compared to 53% in 1993. In 1993 was when Ericsson opened its office in Vietnam. It's when we 
started in 1994, we initiated the first GSM 2G mobile networks in Vietnam, and that's in the, the first time we connected the country, uh, allowing people from urban areas, rural countryside areas and mountainous areas to communicate and uh, to share information. And ultimately, that helped drive social economic development. And of course, through 3G and 4G, the digital economy thrived, and we see more of that moving forward with 5G. Vietnam was able to leapfrog many other countries in socioeconomic development standing and in the well-being of its people by adopting mobile communication and mobile broadband communication. Yeah. Digital transformation, in my view, is the answer. I think all countries have the opportunity to embrace it and we, all of us, have an opportunity to, to assist those countries mm. by supporting them in their digital transformation journey because as soon as you become digitally enabled as a country and your people become digitally enabled in terms of their skill set, yeah. economic growth will happen, social improvements will happen, and environmental impro improvements will happen. You'll get the triple bottom line benefit of social, economic, and environmental benefit from digital transformation. So I still feel, whether it's a developed country or a developing country, I think the same formula applies, but if anything, it's a, it's a great equaliser. Yeah. It really does level the playing field. I hope so. Now, countries that are um, poorer and, and less... Um, um, have less advantages, I guess, in terms of the metrics we use today to measure their success, yes. have the opportunity to grow and develop at a, at a faster rate and at, at an accelerated rate through the adoption of digital transformation and digital technology like 5G. So, so I still feel that 5G, really, and digital transformation enabled by 5G as a critical national infrastructure is the answer. And uh, that provides not only the technology, but more importantly, the the training for people, the start of entrepreneurship and innovation that that will spur will create new jobs, new industries and um, really support the growth and development of many countries around, all countries around the world, but especially those that need it most. Fantastic. I'm looking forward to your promotion. I'm looking forward to seeing that happen. <laughs> Thank you. Dennis, Dennis it's, been job, really, sure. it's been really wonderful talking with you today. Thanks so much for your um, Really great insights, um, which a lot of business owners will be able to take from today um, because many of them will be looking at their own digital transformation. They'll be looking at their advancements. They'll be looking at how do they automate, how do they use IoT, and you've given us lots of um, ideas. So I, I'm excited about the future. I think that our digital future is very um, challenging but also enabling in so many ways. Um, sure. and, you know, and then sort of you, you, on the other hand, we've, we've got this climate thing that we have to deal with and get over the pandemic. So, you know, we, we're still balancing all of these things, but um, conversations with people like you are helping us to get clarity around how to do the balancing, how to go forward. So thanks so much, Dennis. Yes. Really I, have a, I have an Italian background, by the way. So in Italy, they say all roads lead to Rome. And I think when it comes to addressing all these challenges yes. and many more that will emerge in the future that we can't even see today, I think all roads lead to digital transformation. I think digital transformation is really the um, is at the crux of uh, addressing yeah. at, le at least partly, if not completely, a lot of these issues and challenges yeah, around the world. I agree. Fantastic. Dennis Brunetti, Ericsson in Vietnam, uh, Hanoi, Vietnam. Thanks so much. We look forward to seeing you again. All the best. Thank you very much, Pamela. It's been a pleasure. Cheers. Welcome. Thank you.